You know what's bad for the Republican Party when you can't entirely discount the idea it's likely to choose this guy to run the thing? I am 100% running for the RNC chairman against Ronna McDaniel. 100%. I'm all in, Steve. It's one of the most important uh, organizations in our country, and it's 2018, fail. 2020, fail. 2022, fail. That's three Fs in a row. Well, he's not wrong about that. You know, Mike Pillow uh, is correct that Republicans have essentially lost three consecutive elections. And the RNC chair he's trying to unseat, Ronna Romney McDaniel, has formed an expert panel to examine what went wrong in the midterms three weeks ago. How, for instance, did they end up with a guy like Blake Masters as their Senate candidate in Arizona, a man the head of one Republican super PAC said, and I quote here, scored the worst focus group results for any candidate he had ever seen, then went on to lose, formerly Red Arizona, by a whopping five points. So who, you may ask, will be on the expert panel to conduct this 2022 Republican autopsy? How about one of the people responsible for the demise of the patient? Blake Masters, yes, that guy. <laughs> Blake Masters has been tapped by RNC chair, formerly named Romney, who's fighting off wacky pillow millionaire to figure out what is wrong with the Republican Party. Tim Miller served as communications director for Jeb Bush's 2016 presidential campaign. He's a writer at large for The Bulwark. Jen Psaki is a former White House press secretary for President Biden and a host on MSNBC. Both join me now. Um, Tim, what, what do you make of, uh, of Blake Masters on the, on the autopsy committee there? Well, I've got a little bit of expertise here, Chris. Uh, I was on the last autopsy a decade ago. Oh, uh, you were cut, you were cutting in. You had the you, you were getting in there. You were yeah, cutting up the body. I was, I was there, baby. I was there, and we made some really great suggestions that were not taken. Um, I don't know if you if you recall, but uh, an I interesting fact: in addition to creepy Blake Masters, and, and a, a different, uh, separate from that focus group you just aired, a different Republican pollster told me that they'd never seen the word "creepy" so much in the verbatims of a poll than they did during the Senate race in Arizona. But um, in addition to him, they brought back Henry Barber, who who was there with me in 2012, Haley Barber's nephew. Uh, to run this thing, and, and I thought it's interesting. Henry was, was to his credit, one of the ones that was saying that the party needs to reach out more to minorities and, and to women and maybe soften the edges on, on, on certain policies like immigration that are turning, turning off these voters. Um, uh, but they're mixing him in with Harmeet Dillon is another person involved in this. So she's there with Blake in Arizona as a lawyer pushing the Stop the Steal stuff with Kerry Lake. So, you know, it's just kind of a little, little mixing bowl of an autopsy, you know, a little bit of compassionate conservatism and a little bit of election denialism. And kind of we'll see what comes out the other side. Well, I mean, you got to get Haley Barber's nephew in there. <laughs> Obviously, that's a must for any postmortem on the election. Jen, you know, it just strikes me that actually for, for all of the, I think, um, buoyancy the Democrats have after that election, that there is like a fairly straightforward thing you could say here that I think is somewhat worrying for Democrats, right? Which is that you, if you wouldn't nominate creepy weirdos and yeah. if you didn't commit yourself to a frontal assault on American democracy, you know, you could, there's a bunch of people who could be Mike DeWine winning by 15 points, like, which again is not great for Democrats, but it doesn't even seem that complicated to me. Right. No, I mean, look, Governor Kemp, not great for Democrats. No. My governor of Virginia, not great for Democrats. I mean, you can argue over the substance in all of these cases, but if Republicans had picked and frankly had recruited, and a lot of people who work for, have worked for some of these outside Republican Senate groups will tell you this, they did not get their top recruits. I'm stating the obvious here. I think we all know that. And as a result, they had creepy, slightly crazy, kind of way out of the mainstream candidates at a time when historically Republicans should have won back many, many seats. So, yes, there is a path they could certainly take. I don't think my pillow guy, who, by the way, I don't know, do you all remember the day that he was photographed a week before Trump left when he had the meeting? And he had the on the picture of his mm -hmm. notes from the meeting was, uh, I wrote this down because I was like, I can't believe it. Insurrection Act, martial law if mm -hmm. necessary, right? Mm -hmm. That's a guy who's running for RNC chair. So, they don't seem to have learned the lessons, but you're right, Chris. There are scary things for Democrats because they could pick a normal-ish Republican yes. to make it a harder challenge for Democrats in 2024. It is such a weirdly low, low bar. Um, we should note, though, just to get a scope of this, I thought it was fascinating. This comes from Bolts Magazine, which, by the way, is a fantastic resource. They do this amazing uh, election rundown. They look at, like, local elections, so I would 
suggest people check it out. They ran the numbers. Republicans only gained 22 legislative seats this fall out of yeah. more than six thousand that were on the ballot. So, Tim, contra my first point, I'm now arguing against myself, which I like to do, I'm a liberal, uh, that, that contra my first point that it was just these really bad candidates, there is something broader there, right, when you're only picking up 22 legislative seats across the country when there were hundreds picked up in, say, 2010 and other big wave elections. Yeah, I, I want to second that. Bolts is awesome. Uh, that's a great mag. But, um, I, you know, I, <laughs> Look, I think that, that, that some of those lower uh, candidates that were running for lower office got drugged down, though, yeah, by the top of point. the yeah. I do think that these things are related. And I think that Republicans did really well. Democrats did very poorly in fighting for state legislative races. That's another thing. The Democrats have now gotten back into that game, yes. and, and Republicans have a smaller field. So I think that there are a lot of facts at play here. Uh, but, I, you know, obviously, I think that particularly if you look at a state like Arizona, you know, th there could have been significantly more legislative legislative gains than they had, uh, you know, had had the top of the ticket not been so weak. And Georgia is a great example of this, right? Georgia Republicans did pretty well, you know, in state legislative in these lower these lower seats because Brian Kemp was on the top of the ticket and it wasn't just Herschel Walker. It had just been Herschel Walker, that 22 number might have been even lower. Yeah, it's a good point. F final point here, Jen, to me is this is a, a little bit of an elevated question, but I do think there's there's genuine ideological exhaustion in the Republican Party. And I think there's actually yeah. some ideological exhaustion in the Democratic Party. But, you know, Trumpism, there, anyone that's tried to make ideological coherence out of Trumpism, and there's some gestures there, has, hasn't really been able to pull it off. And so at the end of the day, it's like, well, what is this thing? You know, they didn't have a platform. What are they going to do this time around? They're going to cut Social Security. Are they going to vote for the bosses in the railroad strike right. or for the workers? Well, they're going to vote for the bosses. It's like, you got to have something at the core of all this culture war stuff where, you know, you, it's hard to get that far. Right. Look, there's some moral grounding lacking here. And there have been, of course, historical differences between Democrats and Republicans over decades. Right. But there are some uh, viewpoints that used to be stalwarts. And Tim could speak to this of the Republican Party, which is being uh, against anti-Semitism. Right. Being for helping countries around the world who are fighting big bullies like Russia. Uh, there are big vote raising the debt limit so that we don't we're not at off on a, the brink of financial collapse. The question is, who are they? And I do think there are some Republicans, maybe more than a few, even Mitch McConnell, who does know where they are, who are rooted in that, but are not brave enough right now to continue to be vocal about that and lead on those fronts. And that's a problem, too.